do you agree that, you know, it's time that we all wake up and take responsibility, even for our ancestors that did not know any better? been waiting patiently to have this kind of conversation. <laughs> well, it's Wake Up With KC, and today I'm going to talk about something a little different. And, you know, crime scenes and homicides, and, you know, there's a few television shows that, you know, Criminal Minds, then you got Cold Cases, then you got CSI. And then NCIS and all these shows that a crime happens and then they go and solve it. Well, what about the cases that are still haven't been solved? Well, today I have a very special guest, Mark Hoover, who joins me, who created a podcast and it shares his passion and all about it. Mark, welcome to the show. Good morning, Kimberly. I come across fascinating people and, mm -hmm. you know, I, somebody in, told me to, you know, you got to talk to this person. He has a very interesting thing. And I was like, okay, no problem. I'm open. Yeah. But then you actually have a podcast, Catch My Killer. Now, I want to know how did you get started with this what sparked that passion i would say it probably started back in the early 80s maybe 1983 i was a kid i was probably 12 or 13 years old getting ready to go to high school and i remember early in the morning getting a phone call from my grandfather and he had called my dad to tell my dad that one of my cousins had gotten murdered by her boyfriend he had um waited for her to go to sleep, I guess. And he put a, he put something over her face and shot her and while she was asleep. And then he killed himself afterward. So I remember being a kid and hearing the details of that. I wasn't very close with my cousin because she was older than me. But just the fact that that happened and it's just always struck with me. It's, it stayed with me forever. So I had that happen, and then I also worked at. Um, I, I worked with a couple people that got that were also murdered. I worked at a a restaurant called Shoney's back in 1989, and it was in Indianapolis, Castleton. And I worked with a guy named Eric Holmes, and he worked on the salad bar. And he got angry. I guess he got let go. He either got fired or he got sent home for the night. But he came back later with a knife and he robbed the restaurant and he stabbed two managers to death. He stabbed a third person who survived and she she survived and she played dead. And then she went and called the police. Of course, they didn't have cell phones back in those days. So she had to lay there and wait and crawl to the manager's office and make the 911 call. And he got he got tried. He got convicted and he's sitting on death row right now. So his name is Eric Holmes, and he's in Terre Haute, Indiana. He's been sitting on death row since 1994, and I think the reason why they don't execute him is because he has a very low mental – he's mentally challenged, I guess. I think that's probably the only thing that's keeping him alive. So, But I've had some experiences with people who have died tragically – and then back in 2015, I started writing a, a column for a newspaper called The Claremont Sun out of Batavia, Ohio. And then after I've been writing it for over a little over six years now, write about true crime, crime, supernatural things, other things. But I thought oh, I should do a podcast. But what I decided was I didn't want to do a podcast like what other true crime ones, because there's a lot of them out there. And there's some that are really good, but they're all basically the same. They all go to Reddit. They all go to the internet. They regurgitate whatever they find on the internet and repeat it. So if you've got five true crime podcasters and they're talking about Ted Bundy, all five of them are going to give you the same information. They're going to give you the information that you can find on the internet on your own. Right. 
So when I started, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do something different. So I thought about it and thought about it. And I said, what can I do that's different? What can I do to give new information that nobody's ever heard before? Then I got the idea of, well, why don't I actually talk to the families? So I started reaching out to families of unsolved homicide cases, talking to moms, dads, and getting their take on the crime and getting information that's never been revealed to the public from them and then letting them tell the story. And then I also get photographs that have never been seen of the family member that they give to me to share on uh, my Facebook page. So I wanted to do something completely unique and I don't, there might, there might be other podcasters that do the same, but I think mine is pretty known for that type of thing, for actually interviewing mom, dad, surviving brothers, sisters, aunts, cousins. A couple of times I've spoken to journalists who wrote books about crime cases. And I've spoken to like a reporter that covered a crime case for the Cincinnati Inquirer. She did an interview for me. So I've tried to make it unique and just do things completely different from other true crime podcasters. And it, it seems to have been doing pretty well. People seem to have taken to it pretty good because I've gotten a pretty good listenership. Well, congratulations. And Thank you. Yeah, be, be your authentic self. And I think you you created this platform to where, you know, a lot of, you know, like cold case TV show, come on, CSI, NCIS. <clears throat> you yeah. know, it's more of bits and pieces of what they do, but not everything that they do there there's a narrative there's a story there's a plot you know but it's being able to think outside the box and look at certain things that leaves clues to solving you know the murders and whatnot and i've always been you know an inquisitive person you know i ask a question question everything and it's astounding to me of, you know, some of the things that these stories, especially recently with, um, look at uh, the new, recently, the young lady that was with the boyfriend, Brian Laundry, right. and, and the right. girl, I'm like, wow, you know, and with technology and how we have evolved, <clears throat> We have this technology now. Do you think it's safe to say to actually solve crimes that goes 10, 15, 20 years in, ago in the past because of technology? You could get more, better evidence, I guess. Would that be safe to say? Yeah, I mean, I think that technology has done miracles for crime, solving crimes, because now like you just said, you can go back to crimes 15, 20 years ago. And if they secured the evidence and they secured everything just right, um, you can have analysts go and, and check all these materials and look for DNA evidence. So now you're seeing cases of, I mean, pretty much all over the internet now, these guys that committed murders 40 years ago, 50 years ago, these guys are now in their 60s and 70s and even 80s. And they're coming, they're getting arrested, you know, and you're seeing these 70 year old guys in wheelchairs getting arrested, you know, for a murder they committed 30 or 40 years ago. And I, I think that's great. I mean, it is kind of sad because a lot of times maybe mom and dad didn't live to see the day happen. Maybe now the only people left are the grandkids. So maybe a generation didn't get to live to see the justice done. And then you also have to think, OK, this guy's got maybe two or three, four or five years left of life. He got to live, you know, he got to have kids, he got to have get married, he got grandkids, you know, he may have got a good job, but the person that he killed got nothing. You know, he might have killed somebody that was 15 or 16 years old, somebody that was getting ready to just start their life, and that person never had a chance. But this guy, although he's caught and he's going to prison, he got to live a full life. I know that doesn't seem fair, but unfortunately, that's kind of how it goes people you know think that's not fair and i agree it's not fair because they almost got away with it you, you can almost say they got away with it you know because what what the guy in a wheelchair that's 78 years old he's going to sit in prison or maybe get a home arrest or something like that 
he's done. His life is done. What does he care? You know, he knows he's only got a couple years left. He got to enjoy most of his life. So, but I think now with DNA, they're able to solve the cases quicker. So that way you don't have that happen. You don't see a 70 or 80 year old guy getting drugged into court. Now, you know, a 30 year old guy commits a crime, rape. They test the DNA. They find him. They find him in a year. He goes to prison in a year. So he's still young. So he's going to miss out his life. So he, he's not going to get to live his life and he's not going to be able to hurt anybody anymore. So definitely with DNA and all the other. And now they got the, you know, the other DNA that they, the genealogy, which I think is really incredible. That's where they go in and, and OK, let's say they put a DNA match in CODIS and it doesn't pull anything up. They can still solve it. Because what they do is they can go to other databases that people have willingly submitted their DNA and they can test it and they can find a relative. And that's how they solved the um, San Francisco, that the one that was in San Francisco, the serial killer that was a cop. And he was a serial killer in San Francisco. They had his DNA, but they could never match it to him. But they used the genealogy and they matched, they found a relative. And once they find a relative, a cousin or something they, they can go in and start investigating and then that can lead to the killer and that's what happened it's, he was called the golden the golden gate killer the golden gate bridge killer or something you know what i'm talking about uh, that sounds familiar but he was a cop yeah yeah he was a former police officer oh for he, he wasn't uh, like a cop while he was doing the serial killing i don't i don't recall if he was doing it he may have I, actually, I think he he may have been doing some of the killings while he was a cop, but I don't remember all the details about the case, but I know it took a long time, but he had a lot of victims and he finally got caught. But now, I mean, you're seeing like just different guys getting caught through DNA. And I think a lot of people think that it's probably going to be almost impossible to get away with a crime one day eventually. And that could happen. I mean, you're never going to have it be perfect, but. I think it's going to reduce the chances of somebody getting away with something for so long because it's hard from what I understand. And I believe it not to leave something of yourself behind, whether it be yeah. sweat, hair, you know, it can be anything, you know? So yeah, te technology, I definitely think it's great for helping well, solve crimes. Not for nothing, <laughs> but I mean, I've, I've watched some, you know, like 48 hours and, mm -hmm. And uh, there's a, a couple other ones too. But then I sit there and look and think, and I ask this question, why put so much energy and work into planning to murder somebody? Get a life and go do something that makes you know you you happy or fulfilling and purposeful and in a good way. I feel like it just takes so much work and energy just to plan and or do all that stuff. It's like, why bother? Why you can go to the movie and have a good time and laugh and, you know, meet interesting people, travel around the world. I mean, I just right. never made sense to me why some of them did what they did are so sporadic. Right. I agree. You know, I think, I think that too. I think that too. When, when I watch sporadic, these I'm like, you know, it was so random kind of thing. I'm like, something triggered and snapped and it, it's a past trauma and it was just happened kind of thing. And that, that I find very sad because they didn't get the proper help or counseling or some kind of therapy yeah. to help them get through. And I think that's, a, that stems from a lot that do harm. And, you know, some of them are just negative energy and they're, that's it. But there's some that have been traumatized and they ha didn't know how to cope or deal right. with what they went through. And they just projected up to somebody else by saying a word or doing something that just triggered them. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Oh, definitely. Definitely. I mean, there are those kind of cases where something happened to them in the past. I don't know. And they, they have mental issues that they never address. Like for instance, the guy that I know that's on death row, I wouldn't be surprised if that was his circumstances, that maybe something traumatic happened to him. Maybe he had a bad home life, low IQ. I don't know. But I do, I, I agree with what you're thinking about some of these guys. I mean, it's like 
they go through all this plotting and planning and they just do all this work and it's like you know it would just be easier if you just let it go let that person go on with their life you go on with your life and then you don't have to do anything go to prison you don't have to spend the rest of your life going to prison have to hire a defense attorney you can just enjoy your life go take it like you said go take a cruise <laughs> Yeah, go, no, go sit on the beach said, somewhere. What are you thinking? You know, I think away. the same thing. <laughs> and well, it's, it's so, yeah, especially the ones that stalk. Yeah, that leads to they've come to find out they were stalking them, mm -hmm. and yeah. then, then harassing them to the point where they kidnap them, do whatever, and then kill them. I'm like. I could think of better things to do with my time than that. I mean, right. Uh, well, I think that's it. It doesn't make sense. Like, okay, if you're thinking those kind of thoughts, hey, that's a sign, a, a, a red flag going, hey, we need to change the way we think. Right, right. Well, and, and you get the same thing with husbands and wives. Um, you know, so many times, husbands, when they, they get ready to break up, the husband will kill the wife, you know, or sometimes the other way around. But usually it's the husband and he takes the mentality that if I can't have her, nobody will. Well, oh, you know I what? That's that a lot. That's ignorant. I mean, I was married. I was with my ex-wife for 22 years. We got divorced. I just moved on. She moved on. Fine. You know, I mean, I had no intention of hurting her or doing anything to her. It's just if somebody wants to move on, just let them move on. You know, it's not worth, like you said, planning and plotting and scheming, going through all this stuff just to kill the person. Just let it go and move on. It seems simple because to me or you, that's rational behavior. That's how, you know, you're. it's rational. That's what you do. But you have a lot of people, I think, that are just totally unhinged. I mean, you got people that will kill you for a dollar. I mean, you know, they rob people and they kill people for a, a buck or two bucks, you know, or just dumb things. And I don't understand that. And you probably don't understand that either. No. But that person obviously does not think the same way that we do. And I think that that's why you really, especially when you're involved in a relationship, you really got to be careful who you're dating or who you're going to marry or whatever. And I always think there's signs. There's signs. There's always signs. But, you know, you hear oh, people yeah. go, well, I, I didn't think there were, I didn't, um, you didn't look or you saw them, but you chose to ignore them because you were in love. And then you, you miss these things. Like you, you watch how people treat other people. You know, if you're going out with some guy, you go out to eat with a guy. Let's say, for example, you go out to eat with a guy on the first date. He brings the wrong food. Well, this guy loses his mind and cusses this waitress out makes her cry, screams at her. All right, this is your very first date. This is the very first thing you, now he's been nice to you up until this point, but then you see him totally lose his shit against some total stranger. That's a sign right there that there should not be a second date. But you know, a lot of women will go, well, it's okay. He, he, he just lost it for a minute. I'm sure he's fine. If he's going to lose his mind like that with a complete stranger, what do you think he's going to do when he gets, what's going to be like when he gets mad at you for the first time? You know, that's and a very good point. A lot of things. See, I used to be a waiter all through college and I used to, and that, and that was one of the earliest educations I ever got in dealing with people. And I learned a lot for all the years that I did that by waiting tables because I watched very carefully how people interacted as families. And a lot of times I, I would see that. I would see men just lose their mind. I mean, they go, they get mad at me for something, but I would also see them get into arguments with their wives or girlfriends and talk horrible to them. And they didn't even care if I was standing there, you know? So I saw a lot of that. And a lot of times the woman wouldn't, the mother or wife or whatever wouldn't say anything. She would just take it. So I would think, okay, this house, this house, there's this, there's abuse going on in this house. This guy's not, if he's going to scream at her or cuss her out in front of me and doesn't care that I'm standing there watching this, you know, this is a bad guy. 
and I saw that a lot. So, but you know, the signs are there. And you know what? You bringing this up, and thank you for for bringing that up. But then here's my question: They were taught to behave that way from their upbringing. And it, and, and then you're like, you know, the women, the woman just sits there and, you know, and just wouldn't you agree that, you know, in history, women were treated as property. It was right. actually a religious and there's some, there's a book, several books about this, of how women were treated as property. They didn't have a voice. They did not get an education unless they were from a different category of, you know, if you're rich and wealthy, yeah. Right. If you're a woman, you got some education, but they limited your education and they treated you like a piece of property. And they also sold you. <clears throat> and, you know, you were a slave, you were kidnapped, you were raped you know, in history from my research and studying. And it's like mind boggling of, wow, you know, this is now I see why women are still treated the way they are. It still goes on. It's still, and it's it like, still goes on. It goes on. You can see it in the corporate culture. Men still get paid more than women. Men still are open to more better possibilities to earn money and better jobs and better anything you know i mean men are just that's just how it is you know and um and, you know and, and one of the things like i've done some I've, I've done a couple podcast episodes about women in the military that died one of them committed suicide and the other one supposedly committed suicide but was actually i say she was murdered but it's the same thing you know what they were treated badly you know one of them had gotten raped and it's 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 like that in the military. It's that mentality that a lot of men still have, and they think men should be bare, women should be barefoot, pregnant, and in the kitchen. They shouldn't be working, shouldn't be driving. And I mean, there's just so many men that think that way. And I think until men change, you change the way a man thinks about women. You're not going to see many changes on the way men treat women in public, you know, the workplace. Or even have respect for women. Even if a woman's her boss, does the guy even respect her as his boss? Probably not in some situations. Probably not because she's a woman. You know? But here's the thing that I want to make loud and clear. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for the woman, right. men wouldn't be here. Right. Right. Absolutely. And I, I completely agree with you. But I, I don't know why men have a hard time with me personally. I have no issue with it because I grew up in a home where my dad, my mom and dad were married for 50 years and my dad recently passed away, but my dad treated my mom so good. I mean, my dad loved my mom. He didn't disrespect her. He put her first. He took her out. He treated her very, very well. I mean, my dad was, he just loved my mom. So I saw 50 years of that. And then I saw my grandfather do the same thing with my grandmother. My grandfather was a World War II veteran, and he had gotten he he married his high school sweetheart, my grandmother, and they were together until he died. And I always saw the same thing. My grandfather treated my grandmother with so much love, respect, kindness. Grandpa treated grandma like an equal. My dad treated my mom like an equal. I never got my my neither one of those men ever. Me, as a child, growing up, watching and learning from these two men, I never got the impression that, hey, women are, women are inferior to men because my dad and my grandfather treated women as equals. And they always told me when I was growing up, women are equal to men. Do not treat them like they're property or like they're something less because they're not. You wouldn't be here without women. And that was the attitude that my dad and my grandfather had. And they were strong men. And I think a strong man truly can project that to his son. And it's the weaker man that cannot accept a woman as an equal. And I think a lot of times where men physically abuse women or they kill them in these crime cases or rape women, it's because a lot of them just feel that women are insignificant. 
You know, they, they haven't moved on from Little House on the Prairie or the 1700s when they couldn't vote or, like you said, they were property. And I, I don't understand why they still go that way, but maybe it's probably because that's how they were learned. They learned that way when they were growing up. Their dads yeah, because them. there is a religion. I was brought up in a Southern Baptist religion, and it was all God first, then man, then woman, then child. I'm like, that doesn't make sense. I'm Baptist also. I've seen that. Uh, but that's taught. That's a, a, a mental programming that the men are always going to be above. Right. I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense because if God loves all his children and we are created in his image, then we are all equal and alike. Right. 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 I mean, I went to one. I went to a Baptist church that I know they're different, but I, I went to one that I found really disturbing and I, I can only go for so long. And I. I had a long talk with the pastor and I said, man, I can't do this. I can't come to your church anymore because I don't agree with your philosophy. And they did the same the thing. The women all wore dresses or skirts. They all had long hair. They didn't cut their hair. They never wore pants. They didn't cut their nails. And, you know, they, they a lot of them didn't have jobs. And I asked my pastor one day, I said, why is it that you can get a haircut you can wear jeans, you can go to the gym and work out, you can drive, you can have a career, you can have all these things, but your wife isn't allowed to have any of those things. She's expected just to stay home and cook and take care of the kids. She's not allowed to have a job. I'm like, I don't understand that logic. I'm like, why is that? And he says, because that's God's way. I'm like, that's not God's way. I said, that's man-made, that's your way. That's what you all do to keep them in their place. And he just said, that's just the way it is. And he goes, you know, same thing. That's how I, my mom was the same way too. My mom wasn't allowed to work. My mom wasn't allowed to wear jeans. I'm like, I, I don't get that. You know, you guys are stuck in the past. Right, right. History You're right. keeps repeating itself until you wake up and realize, wait a minute, that, that's been going on for centuries. And look at all the failures on that. Well, we need to change that so we don't have to repeat that and make it better. Right. But like you said, a lot of the churches teach this. And when the churches teach this and you're raised in that environment, like his daughters, he's got like three or four daughters, no sons. His daughters were all raised that way, too. So that's what they all saw. They're all grown now. But I, I don't know what I don't know what if they if they followed that that teaching, but they were that's how they were taught their whole lives from the moment they were born. And they were taught the man is superior. And what's fascinating to me in these times, it takes mm -hmm. two people to go to work, right, and make a family. Uh, you got a mortgage, you got cars, you got, yeah. and you can't make it off of one man's living these days. And then if you yeah. have kids, do you know how much kids cost on a yearly basis? I mean, come on. Right. Oh, I agree. So, well, I think, yeah, I think a lot of that thinking has to do with why wives get murdered. Because I think eventually some of them, they just get, wait a minute, I don't want to live like this. I want to be able to work. I want to do what I want to do. I don't want to be with this controlling guy anymore. I want to have my own life, spend my own money, make my own money, and do my own thing. And then you get men that just cannot accept that. And that those are the, and I think that a lot of that's where you get the, well, if I can't have you, no other man's going to have you, you know. So instead of just letting her go, he has to kill her. You know, that makes no sense to me, but. Well, what about the guy, what about people that, you know, their the narcissistic behaviors and the misogynist behaviors like they're so full of charm and i've noticed lately with the younger generation the women want to be more independent they don't want to uh -uh. i'm going to do my own thing do and I, i'm seeing that transition and i guess that feminine energy changing and with the younger generation that's starting having kids, they're more involved now. I look at the younger generation, I'm like, wow, what happened? 
you know, there's this guy that's actually changing a diaper. And there's this guy taking his kids on a walk. And then there's this guy doing this with their child. And I was just like, okay, this is a good change. Yeah. You know, and being equal, it, it, you know, teamwork <clears throat> makes dream work. That's my philosophy. That's you know, a good one. In, in uh, any relationship, it has to be a win win. Right. You know, if it's Absolutely. a win win, it'll be successful and prosper. But if it's not and it's out of instant gratification or selfishness, it's not gonna it's not gonna work and, and it won't last long either. So why even bother? All right. Yeah, yeah the eighteen yeah. hundreds are gone. Little house on prairie is gone. Those days are gone. You know, everybody's you, you try to live and do better and learn from your mistakes and learn from the past. Well, so all then, that little house yeah. on the prairie was just a story. Doesn't necessarily mean that was really what was going on in back in those days. They just wanted to paint you a pretty little picture. But behind the scenes, that could have been a different story. I'm sure it was. Well, oh, that's yeah. that. Yeah, I'm sure it was. Most definitely. You know, and it's you got to go inward to discover the truth. And you say a lot of times about you mentioned earlier about the signs. You know, we just don't pay attention to them. <clears throat> or we deny them. Now, here's one sign. It's my intuition. That gut feeling if something doesn't feel right. Especially when you're seeing and you're in that moment, it doesn't feel good. Pay attention to it. It's your body communicating to you, giving you a warning sign. Not right. good. Right. And, and guys, will, I'm a guy. I know. Guys are guys are fools. They, they, they give... They give signals. I mean, if they're a bad guy, they're going to give you signals. I mean, you know, if they hit you or if they call you something, a really bad word, you know, and then they try to go, well, I'm sorry, it won't happen again. Um, yeah, it will happen again because they just tested you because they know they got away with it once. They'll probably get away with it again. If they keep doing it, they're going to get away with it. They just tested you. So, I mean, there's a lot of game playing and mental games and everything that go on in relationships. But if you're yeah, smart enough why? to see them, you know. Why? Do I feel like that's so unnecessary. I don't have time for those games anymore. It's like, look, I'm going to tell you like it is. And if you don't like it, go your merry way. But if we, we can work together, fine. I'll, I'll give you a chance. And I, I, I remember this saying, it's fool me once, shame on you. Fool right. me twice, shame on me. I, I love that saying. Yeah, that's very true. But you know what, though? The thing is. It takes us to, to go through these bad experiences and surviving these bad experiences when we're young and we don't realize what happened until we're 50 or 40. You know, you look back and you go, you, you look at your 20s and you think in your relationships and you're like, why did I drop one single tear over this woman? Why was I begging this woman to come back to me? God. You know, yeah. I, I was stupid. I mean, how many how many times can you look at yourself now at your age now and look back and think, why did this guy even make me cry? Why did I let this guy make me cry? Yeah. Why did I even let this dude talk to me like call me a bitch? You know, why why did I even allow that? I must have been really stupid. And, you oh, know, I, 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 we all I, look back on those days. Thing. I'm like, why? Well, now if a guy calls me a bitch, I'm like, let me tell you something. That's damn straight. I'm a bitch. And I could be an even bad bitch when I want to be. So don't fuck right. with me. <laughs> right. That's, and, and that's how you got to be. But people aren't like that when they're in their 20s. They may just take it. But then you call, you say that to a 40 or 50 year old woman, you're going to get a different reaction. Mm -hmm. So you got to learn through a bunch of stupid mistakes to make it to be a smart adult. And, and, you know, like, it's like your own kids, you know, you see your kids go through relationships and I, I saw it all the time with my sons when they were growing up, they would date these girls. And I'm like, dude, this girl, this is not the right girl for you. You need to move on. Oh, dad, I love her. She loves me. I'm like, dude, you don't even know what love is. Th that girl does not love you. You don't love her. You know, you, you five years from now, you won't even remember her. Oh, no, no, we'll be together in five years. No, you won't be with her in five years. Well, oh, how do you know? Oh, we know. 
it's like we know parents intuition and just living long enough to get smart we look at these situations and we know but you know your kids don't listen like you didn't listen to your parents when your parents told you you know well it's kind of like a cycle of stupidity but here's the thing if why you know i and you can you know tell me if i'm wrong or if i make a Mm -hmm. valid point but we're taught limited love instead of unconditional love but love starts from within i think we're taught that love is basically what our parents teach us of what love is and that could be wrong you know there really really is no right way or wrong way about it however it does speak volumes later we just don't recognize it because we don't know any better but we are love love you have to experience inside you cannot experience love from another person or from your parents or your partner or even your children it, it, it's something that's inside that expands and it's an emotion and a feeling in this energy that you're once you tap into that and you experience that it changes your whole outlook on how you communicate and deal with people now with my children I mean, when you have children, that's a different kind of love. You know, especially when you take care of it. And I guess with women, it's a natural thing, most natural thing, unless they were dealing with abusive things growing up from their environment. But in general, most women, it's that nurturing, like Mother Earth, caring, nurturing, trying to help, trying to you know, take care until you could go out into the world. Um, but until you can do, you, you're not, we're going to be in that same pattern of the limited love, restricted love. Love has rules when the truth is with love, there is no rules. You don't need them. Right. right. Yeah, I agree with you. It, it, like you said, you got to love yourself first. And yeah, loving yourself and first is, is I not. think you misinterpreted that love one another. And I questioned that. I'm like, well, how can you love another if you don't even know what love is yourself? You can't give it out if you don't have it in you. If you don't recognize that it's already in you. And it's an experience. It's not something that you're taught. And right. I think there's, that's where the misconception comes in what is love. You know, but it's inside us. That's the beauty of it. It's waiting for you to connect, to wake up to it. So you can realize that, oh, shit, I had it all wrong. And so does everybody else. But this Mm -hmm. is awesome. Absolutely. I agree with you. It all comes from within. You know, you have to love yourself. You have to love yourself enough to, you know, not accept bad behavior. You know, you not letting a man call you a bitch you not allowing a man to hit you you know you have to love yourself enough to know that's not right i'm not gonna allow this right because i love myself i care about myself you know and i i'm not gonna allow this and i think too many people unfortunately men as well they they don't have that you know, I, I don't know what they don't have that confidence in themselves they don't have those feelings they just accept it and they they take it and to some people they think that is part of love well, I know he hits me, but I but he loves me though. He only hits me when he's drunk. Or, you know, he only calls me a bad name when he's mad at me. But but he loves me though. I mean, I'm you've yeah. probably heard that. I've heard that. So from yeah. people, I'm like, you're nuts. That's not true. That's not love. But it's hard to tell somebody that, you know, when they're in love, they don't want to listen, you know. But it's not that they're in love, they're infatuated. It's lust. Yeah. Right. And it, you're up. covering, mm-hmm. you're not dealing with the true root right. of the attraction and why you attracted this type of person in the first place. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and you'll see it with abused women. Like I had a friend years ago and she was with a guy that was on drugs all the time and was mentally abusive to her. So she finally gets the courage to leave this guy. And what does she do? She runs off. And she gets with an alcoholic that does her the same way. So she goes from a drug addict to an alcoholic. And it's like, 
You didn't learn anything. <laughs> she didn't. She didn't learn nothing. You went to the same kind of guy, you know, different addiction. But, you know, some people, they really, they just don't, they don't learn, you know, and they end up becoming victims. They end up becoming the people that you see on the front cover of a newspaper one day that was killed by their significant other mm -hmm. for one reason or another, you know, and that's like, that's kind of, I guess that's what happened with my cousin. You know, she tried to leave him and she put up with his bad behavior for a while. And she, when she got to the point where she didn't want to deal with it no more, he chose to end her life and his own. So, you know, I, I don't get that mentality, but it's out there. So, uh, yeah. It, it, until we wake up and change the way we think and recognize right. about these programs and these limited beliefs and whatnot, our world would be so much far better. <laughs> I'm like, come on, let's wake up. That's why I started this show. Wake up with KC so I can have fascinating conversations like I am right now with you, Mark. And I, it, it's truly a pleasure. And let me ask you something about um, some of these cases and whatnot have you you know met some cases where there was a person that come to find out was innocent and not guilty because of the technology of what they found you know and then they go back and discover like oh we got the wrong person no because most of the cases that i've gotten there is no nobody's been identified all of them pretty much there's nobody's ever been identified so oh, no. yeah so there there's nobody to go and say oh this was we got the wrong guy there is no guy that's the problem and some of them they do have dna but the problem is they can't match it to anybody so having dna is useless if there's no match and that's that's the problem and then a lot of the problem is a lot of these cases get no exposure so nobody's ever heard of it so if you put it out there well, it was like the case you were talking about earlier, um, Brian, Lundy. the one that was all over the media. Yeah. Cases don't get that kind of, you know, publicity. That case was partially solved because of social media and it being on the media and witnesses and people coming forward with information and giving information to the cops. Somebody found the truck or the van, you know, somebody seen them, you know, and all that attention helped bring that case to a close. Now think if every homicide case got that kind of attention, I mean, that, that would be really something, but a lot of them get nothing. I mean, some of them don't even get anything in the newspaper. All they get is they get with you. When you look up a case, the only thing you'll see is the obituary and that's it. I mean, some of them get nothing and that's sad. I, I don't think it's right, but that's just the way it is. So I try to help people get exposure for their cases because you never know. It only takes one person with the right tip to call in and, and say, hey, I know what happened here. I was there or I know something about this case. So that's why it's very important to get those out there so people know about them. You know, well, and how do you come across these cases that no one else is. You know, paying attention to. They contact me. A lot of times when, when I first started, it was kind of hard because they were leery of me because they'd never heard of me or anything. But after doing it for a couple of years, people feel comfortable enough that they'll contact me and they'll go, hey, I got a relative. I want to I had a guy write to me not too long ago, he said he's got a nephew that was murdered and nobody's given it any attention. You know, or some of these people have said we've tried to get on Nancy Grace, try to get on Dr. Phil and nothing. You know, we, nobody will nobody will even talk about it. So. You know, I talk about it and that way they can share it with people and then let other people know about it. So that's pretty much what my goal is to find people that just feel desperate. You know, and they just want to find somebody that'll listen to them. So know, this is like a platform that you created for yeah. people that, you know, has lost somebody through a crime. Mm -hmm. And they've been waiting for results waiting for justice and they just get i guess lost in the cracks kind of thing and right. you just bring it back to life so there can be justice and and whatnot yeah that's true 
And, that, and that's what I'm trying to do. I mean, if I can get a family any kind of attention, I mean, I've had like ID discovery contact me. I was actually on one of their shows. I was on uh, season four, episode five of still a mystery covering a case, talking about a case. And I've been on Fox news um, talking about cases. So these people have heard the podcast and they've reached out to me and they've said, Hey, you talked about this case. Would you talk about this case on, on the news? I'm like, sure. Anything to help get publicity out, you know? So, I mean, that's, that's the goal. And I recently had, I just spoke to a mother of a case, one of the earlier podcasts that I had done, they just found out who the, who killed their son. And when I had done the podcast over a year ago, they were trying to find out who killed their son. Well, I recently reached out to her because I saw an update on it and she got just, well, I don't know if you want to call it justice because the person that killed her son, somebody killed him. So it was karma. Ooh, but karma. Somebody murdered, I think somebody murdered him too. So the guy that killed their son, somebody killed him. So, you know, well, <laughs> although he didn't go to prison, the family's happy. They're like, well, he's dead now. So we don't, we're okay with ju that. That's justice. You know, and it, that's uh, sad in a way that, you know, it's it's part of that universal law, law of attraction. You know, it's like a Oprah Winfrey is like a boomerang. What you put out there, you're going <clears> to <throat> get back in, whether good or bad. So that's why I focus always on the good. And I, I have to think... honestly li like yeah. limit myself on how much news I, I take in because you're absorbing that energy. I don't think people get away with it. I think that if you do, maybe you get away with it on this earth, but I think sometime you'll pay for it afterward. Or what will happen is you commit this crime and your life will just be totally meaningless. You won't ever accomplish anything in your life. You won't ever make any, you won't ever find a good job. You won't be able to sustain a relationship. Your kids will hate you. you you'll die early of cancer. You'll get, you'll get COVID or you'll get a disease. You know, I think if you were to look and go back on some of these people. I really doubt if any of these people that have gotten away with these committing these murders are living a really, really good life. I'd, I'd, I'd bet my house that most of them are not living good lives. Wherever they are, they're living troubled lives because I just think that that's the way it is with the universe karma. I don't think that you can do some be a cruel, evil person and get a good life. I, I don't. I believe you reap what you sow. And it goes like what, you know, I'm very conscious about is it could go on to generations and pass on to generations. Why would I want to do something that will harm my future generations? Right. That I mean, I, I wouldn't want harm to be done to my own kids or my great grandkids or, or whatnot. So I'm not doing anything that would jeopardize them having a better life for my future generations. I, I don't understand why most people don't think that way. Well, because they don't have the sense. Like you said earlier, we were talking about they don't have that same up here, something they're missing up there that me and you have about the logic about, well, why would I do all this plotting and planning to do this, to kill somebody, when I can just move on and go take a cruise instead or go lay on a beach somewhere? It's that same logic that you and I have that would be, that's how we would look at it. It's just common sense. It's they, no right. logic. They, it's they, don't, they don't have it. <laughs> People don't have it. I, for some reason or another, they're born without it, I guess. I, I don't know. <laughs> so. it, I find it's just like, wow, really? <laughs> right. I, I always think of, you know, I'm always thinking about my show. I work a part time job, I keep, you know, like productive, busy. You know, I'm still growing my audience, you know, and this, I'm a one man show. I'm the producer, the director, the, you know, editor, you know, the whole, whole nine yards I'm, and I have to do the camera, the lighting, and I'm still trying to adjust some things. I still see a shadow on the back of me and I'm like, Wah! so I'm like, just ignore the shadow. It's okay. Show yeah. must go on. It's yeah. all about the content. It's all about the content. You could have the best well-made show on the planet with the best, prettiest graphics, but if the content sucks, nobody's going to listen to it. No. You, have to, you have to have good content that people want to listen. They can overlook the shadow in the background. They can overlook the coughing. As long as you have good content that people want to hear, you're fine. Yeah. 
Well, thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so when can um, the listeners, the audience, you know, where can they tune in to catch my killer? And when do you have episodes airing? Every week, every Sunday, Sunday morning, 10, 11 o'clock, www.catchmykiller.com is the website. All you gotta do is click on it and you can, you can listen to the latest episode, or you can also see links to my column. If you want to read about a true crime story, you can also read there or my bio. So I have all of it on my website, catchmykiller.com. But yeah, for all your listeners, I'd like them to take a listen and see who knows. I mean, maybe one of these cases will strike a chord with them. You know, maybe they'll see something and go, hey, wait a minute, I used to live in that neighborhood. You know, I might know something about that. You know, maybe you thought it wasn't anything at the time, but now you look back and you go, well, wait a minute, I lived underneath that person. I heard a bunch of noises coming from upstairs and screaming. Maybe I thought it was a fight. I didn't realize it was somebody getting killed. I mean, it only takes one. You only need one good tip that could that could solve a case. You know, just one. And it can lead to a whole lot of good tips. So I encourage everybody to take a listen to it. Uh, yes, absolutely. And just one more question before we wrap things up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've heard that, you know, there's, because I'm a, an intuitive trans medium. So mm-hmm. on the spiritual, like, if you want to call it psychic, whatever ability, sure. everyone has a spiritual gift, more in tune to it um, than others. But have you heard of, you know, somebody using like psychics to help solve a crime? Um, yeah, and I, and I do believe in that because I do have some experiences like that. I actually had an experience like that where I had, I've had, I get, I actually get people come to me and tell me. And I've actually seen a couple of cases that I've that I've had the victim come to me get solved. So, yeah, I've experienced it where I've had the, the victim come to me and I've had all that going on probably for about 20 years. So and I do have that. What you're connected talking about. Like me. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. But it's 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 hit or miss. It's just really weird. It's something I don't understand. It just kind of comes and goes on its own. I don't have any control over it. I mean, it's just, I don't even understand it. So That's okay. I don't have any just control. be open to it because if, because if they're coming to you, they're trying to get justice for what happened to them right, and, right. And, and whatnot. So I find that awesome. Like I would, you know, you, you got the gift. That's why there was a connection to why you catch my killer. It's yeah. going to do more just, Tune into that and be open to that because that is a unique gift to help people that have, you know, been brutally and, you know, had their life taken and it might not have been their turn yet. And Right, right. So at least they could, you know, help them solve. So and they're probably already thinking about, you know, their, their loved ones that are still here. You know, so they could have a peace of mind, too. So this is a way that they, you know, so. It's a real ability. A lot of people don't believe in it. They don't believe in spirits or supernatural. But everybody has, everybody has that ability. It's just that some people are more susceptible to it because they're more willing to believe it. Where other people who doubt it, don't believe in it, they don't see anything because they just close, they're closed off to it. So. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I believe it's real. Oh, I know it's real. I've experienced, Mm -hmm. like, it wasn't that I was susceptible. I guess because I questioned everything. Mm -hmm. And if something didn't seem right, sound right, or, you know, and then I would experience something, I'm like, oh, holy shit, what was that? Right. (laughs) You know, (laughs) like, what was that? You know? I, this doesn't make sense. So it's just that was my spiritual awakening and my journey. And that's how I got out of religion. Yeah. And yeah. See, I kind of wrestle with that because as a Christian, I've been a Christian my entire life. You don't believe in stuff like that. But when you happen to have things like that, spiritual awakenings and things like that go on, you wrestle with it because you're like, well, wait a minute. If I'm a Christian, I can't believe this stuff, but it's happening to me. So 
how do I, what, what do I do? How do I, do I accept this or am I crazy? And, well, here's the thing. You don't have to be a Christian. Just be a divine being that you are. Right. Because we're spiritual beings, sexual beings inside a human being. Right. Yeah. That's we're just human beings. We don't have to label ourselves based on religion. Just have good morals, good, you know, behavior. Be a good person. That is it. That's what I tell people. If, if they could do that, this place would be a wonderful place to live in, this world. Yeah. Because really, just... I've learned from religion and history and how it was originated and why it was created. And there is so much judgment and persecution over people that did just not convert to someone else's religion. Well, if you think about it, more people have been killed over religion than any other reason ever. Thank you. That's Thank the number you. one reason why. So why would time. I want to join that group? Right. Absolutely. You go back to history and you look at all the millions and millions and millions of people that have been slaughtered. Why? Because you didn't fall in with what I believed in. Religious. Yeah, you are a Christian. You are Muslim, so we have to kill you. Or you're a Christian. And I'm a Muslim, so I have to kill you. You know, I mean, yeah, that's the number one reason. Religion keeps us divide, divided, honestly, if you think about it. Much. It does. Very judgmental. Yeah. Not always good. The biggest murderers in history. Oh, yeah. We thought wars were? No. <laughs> that was part of the reason. <laughs> Until you wake up and like... Damn, they had it wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. <laughs> we all have it wrong. Now we just we have an opportunity to get it right, and why not for the future generations? Sure, I they're agree. worth it. They they shouldn't have to. We shouldn't have to be keep repeating history like Groundhog's Day. You Bill know, because I see this. This is how my visualization works. It's it's Groundhog's Day. I see that the history and the timelines of everything. I was like, we're repeating history every day. It's just our clothing looks different and this and that looks different. But yeah, I can. I like what. Yeah. <laughs> and as humans, we don't learn from it. Never do. Are you waiting till you get that wake up call or something drastic has to happen in order for you to go through right. that, you know, to experience that finally? Why wait? Why not? You know what? I'm ready to wake up now. Show me the truth. Great. So I just, I love having these conversations. I really do, Mark. I could go all day. <laughs> But it was definitely a pleasure. I wish you the best of success. Thank you. My killer. And I, you know, keep, be open to that gift that you have to help solve these, these crimes that happen and, and not being closed because it will, more will come because they know, they, they know who you are and what you do. I'm sure they do. And and thank you for stepping up to do that for them. I thank that you. I appreciate. You know, understanding the spirit realm that that's not my the gift and my calling to be into because I but I love and admire those that do. And you're you're part of that group, so I thank you for showing you. up. Thank you. Mm -hmm for doing what you do for those people yes ma'am thank you it Appreciate was really it. a pleasure and i look forward to having you again and we could catch up on cases and whatnot i would be it would be an honor thank you ma'am appreciate it yep look forward to it all right let me see right. this i've got some more fascinating i just love this like what I do, honestly. <laughs> I can tell that's good. That'll help you go a long way being successful. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you and uh, have a good afternoon. You too.
Well, there you go. I did not realize Mark was very connected to the spiritual realm and helping solve crimes of people that have closed or their life was cut too short. Their life ended unexpectedly. And I always wondered about that. Like, what happens now? Like, did, you know, did, was this a, re you know, there's a reason for why everything happens. But then, you know, what about stuff like that? And Mark is helping. Go catch my, catch my killer podcast with Mark Hoover. Look him up. The description's down below. And like I say, you never know who I'm going to get on this show. Do you agree that, you know, it's time that we all wake up and take responsibility, even for our ancestors that did not know any better? I've been waiting patiently to have this kind of conversation. <laughs>